Welcome to lecture 20. And lecture 20 is going to talk about alkenes. And we are in chapter 7. Um, we've talked about alkanes. That's been our functional group that we focused on. We've talked about alkyl halides and uh, alkanes. We made alkyl halides using free radical halogenation reaction. And then in chapter six, we talked about how to convert alkyl halides to other functional groups by what we call nucleophilic substitution. And we talked about two different mechanisms for nucleophilic substitution. We talked about if it's um, a unimolecular, SN1. It means that the rate of reaction is only proportional to the concentration of your alkyl halide. And then we also talked about SN2, where the rate of the reaction is proportional to your alkyl halide and your nucleophile that's going to do the substitution. Now, in Chapter 7, we're going to talk about a new functional group called alkenes. And we're going to talk about how to make them. And how do we make alkenes? We do either an E1 or an E2 reaction. The E stands for elimination. And once again, you'll see that the 1 means unimolecular for the rate of reaction. And E2 is bimolecular, meaning the rate of reaction is going to be um, based on your, um, it'll be based on your base plus your alkyl halide. So we're still using alkyl halides and alcohols, and they're going to go through an elimination reaction to make an alkene. Okay, so in this uh, lecture 20 video, we're just going to start talking about the alkenes. And we're going to talk about the th nomenclature. Uh, we'll talk about the, um, the thermodynamic stability of the alkenes. And I'm also going to talk about elements of unsaturation, give you a little bit of vocabulary, and then we'll go into uh, the Pogel exercises, the next lectures for 10A and 10B. Okay, so starting with the alkene, um, they're also called olefins. And that was like an old um, name for oil forming gas. Um, alkenes are the carbon carbon double bond. And so if we take an alkene here, something like this. This is. Four carbons, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. And the functional group is the carbon carbon double bond. So we have to go through that carbon carbon double bond when we're naming it. And so it would be two butene. And that's kind of how I learned to name compounds. Um, the new, new school way is to go but and then put the two in let you know that the carbon-carbon double bond is on the um, carbon number two. Uh, this is a pi bond. So what's the hybridization? This carbon is bonded to one, two, three things. So that would be sp2, two plus one is three. And this other carbon is an sp2. So that means it has one unhybridized p orbital above and below the plane. And then these substituents are 120 degrees from each other. And you know that that's planar. And so this pi bond, those electrons, are basically in the unhybridized p orbital. Okay, so that is the structure. 
there's some nice um, slides and um, pictures in your book. Now, the single bonds, you get rotation. So, and you can do that with models and see that they rotate. The double bond, there's no rotation. And we've kind of hinted on this when we talked about cis versus trans. And so, this is cis and this is trans. So when you do cis and trans, what you want to do is there's always going to be two things on this carbon, of the carbon carbon double bond. And so you just look on one side. I literally take my hand and cover it up and you're comparing a carbon from a hydrogen. So if you look at the atomic number, you're looking at six versus one. Okay. So this would be higher priority one. Then you come on the other side and you'd have to draw on your hydrogen and you're looking at six versus one. So this is your higher priority. Okay. And then you compare, okay, we have a one and a one. The highest priority is on the same side and that makes them cis. That's also Z in the naming. So Z is um, a German word or like the actual German word. Um, yeah, here we have these Zusemen, and it means together. Okay, Zusemen. And then the other one is E, which means integer. So this would, this other one here would be E. And this is Entgenen, which is German for opposite. Okay, and so. Once again, you look at one side and you're comparing the carbon and the hydrogen. The carbon gets number one. You look at the other side here, comparing a carbon and a, and a hydrogen. This is number one. And you see your number ones are on opposite side of this double bond because you have a top and a bottom. There's no free rotation around that um, double bond. They're on the other side, so then that would be E. Or you could say trans. You do need to know both of these. This is called the EZ naming system. It's in your book, and it also follows the um, Kahn Ingold prelog rules. And those were the rules we just did um, in Chapter 5 where we assign higher priorities. And this one's easier because, like I said, you're only looking at one side, and you're only comparing two things, and then you're looking at the other side, and you're comparing two things. And then after you rank number one and number one, if they're on the same side, they're going to be cis, which is cis or z. Or if they're on the other side, opposite side, it's going to be e or trans. All right, so that's a little bit of naming. We can do a little bit more naming here. Um, okay, so let's name, I'll just put some of these out here and then we can just name a bunch of them. Okay, so we'll just do some naming here. Now, this is, you have to count. You've got to give the highest priority to the carbon-carbon double bond. You've got to go through it. So one, two, three, four. So this would be, I would do one butene. You could also do but one ene. Now, the thing is, then you have to do your cis, um, easy test cis trans test okay so you cover this up now if you look at this side okay what are the two things there okay so you can draw them in what are they hydrogen and a hydrogen are those the same they're the same if they're the same then no no cis and trans isomerism so it's just butene 
Okay. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, how many carbons? You get six. So this is cyclohexene, and you don't have to put a number. Um, everybody would know that you'd have to start with one and you'd have to go through it. Okay, this one, you start here, one, two, three, four, five. If you start the other side, it would give the double bond a three rather than a two. So you're going to start on this side. And so then you say, okay, what's five? Five is pentane. So now we drop the ane and we write E and E for the alkene. And it's a two. Do we need cis and trans? Well, you have to do your cis and trans test. So over here, what two things are you comparing? You're comparing a hydrogen versus a CH3. So atomic number six and one. So this is number one. And then we come over here. And what are we comparing? We're comparing a CH2, CH3 versus a hydrogen. You can draw it in if you need to. Okay, so this is number one. And so then you compare your number ones. Okay, you got one on this side and one on that side. Are they opposite? Yes, so that would be trans. And for a name like this, you would want um, E. So this would be E. And you just put E in front. I think of E.T. because that was the first movie I saw at the movie theater. And E is, E.T. is trans. You can come up with your own mnemonic. Okay, so for number in this one, you got to start here. You would start one and go clockwise. You can always go clockwise or counterclockwise, but you want to give that substituent the lowest. So this would be one dash methyl cyclopentene. And everybody knows you have to start on the one, so you don't have to put the one on there. Okay, this one, you'd want to start number in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because you've got to go through that double bond for your longest chain. And so seven is heptane. So hep one ene, and then your substituent here is an ethyl, three dash ethyl. And do we have to do cis and trans? Do the test. No, because that carbon there has a hydrogen versus a hydrogen. And so that's the same thing. So they have no cis and trans. So you're done with your name. Okay. So you can practice some more naming. I do want to point out that the relationship. So you know um, what's the relationship between these two. You know that's going to be a type of question you get. Okay. So what is the molecular weight? Let me like your formula. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, C4, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, H8. This one's C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 6, 7, 8. So same molecular formula. Okay, let's give it a name. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2 butene. And then we see that we have between hydrogen and a methyl, the methyl is the highest. Between methyl and hydrogen, methyl is the highest. So what is this? This is E for trans. Come over here and do the next one. You have the methyl versus the hydrogen. Methyl versus the hydrogen, they're on the same side. So this one is Z. 2-butene. Okay, so the connectivity is the same except um, cis and trans, and these are called diastereomers. Diastereomers. They don't have a sterogenic center. Okay, there's no R and S, but they're cis and trans, and cis and trans are diastereomers. And that would be a stereo isomer. We've talked about different stereoisomers. We've talked about enantiomers. We've talked about and diastereomers. Okay, um, let's do elements of unsaturation.
elements of unsaturation. So unsaturated, have you ever heard of unsaturated fats? So if you eat a fatty acid, okay, and you get something, this is a trans fat. Are they good for you? Okay, um, you look on your food thing and on your labels, you can see saturated fat and unsaturated fat. Okay, unsaturated fats are going to be more easily digested. Saturated fats are like animal fat. Crisco, okay, they're gonna be solid at room temperature. Okay, they're going to be solid at room temperature and they're going to require more energy to digest. Unsaturated fats um, are like your, your plant oils. Okay, and so they're easily digested. Now, plant oils though typically look something like this. Okay, so you see how you have cyst bonds and this helps when they stack to not stack so well. It's like if you take a big thing of paper and you have like 10 sheets of paper and you wad them up and then you try to straighten them out, it's going to be easy to pull those pieces of paper apart. And if you get like 10 brand new sheets of paper, how do you separate them? You almost got to lick your fingers and, and get them so you don't get two at a time. Well, that's stacking, okay? And so um, these are kinky, okay? They create kinks in the structure and it makes it easier for us to digest. Um, where do you get trans fats? Trans fats come about like a margin. Okay, they're man-made synthetic. And so a trans fat would be like something like this, and you see where you have the trans bonds, and those are not good for you. Okay, they're made to make margin. So when we manipulate the cysts um, or the uh, animal fats, we ma manipulate them into trans fat, okay? This is called unsaturation. So a saturated carbon looks like this. Okay, so this is a saturated compound. An unsaturated compound, some of the carbons have um, minus two hydrogens. So what would this saturated compound be? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. C9H3678910112131415161 H20. Okay, and so that's CNH2N plus 2. So if you put in the number 9 for N, and then 9 times 2 is 18 plus 2, that is a formula for a saturated carbon compound. Okay, so this unsaturated, if it has C9, it's just going to be H20 minus 2, it's going to be 18. So you can count that up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Make sure you just have the 9. And then you can count the hydrogen. You see that that's 18. So to do elements of unsaturation, what you do is you first figure out um, what would that saturated carbon be. So, and then you subtract the number of hydrogens. So 20 minus 18 is 2. And then you divide that by two. So you have one degree of unsaturation. And you see how you have one double bond. Um, your, the formula is right here equals one half 2C plus 2 minus H. Okay, C is the number of carbons. H is the number of hydrogens. And so your um, problems show stuff like that. I want to also show you other degrees of unsaturation. So if you have a ring, okay, that has one degree of unsaturation. And this will help you when you're trying to figure out um, structure. So what would, this is four carbons. So this is how I do it. Okay, if you have four carbons, what would be a saturated compound? Remember CNH2N plus 2, so C4H8910, okay, and this one is what, our compound, 
C4H, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, now we subtract the number of hydrogens, see from your saturated minus unsaturated, divide by 2. Okay, so you have, this is saturated, this is your unsaturated or your compound that you care about. So it's 10 minus 8 divided by 2, which is 1 degree of unsaturation. Okay, so what about this one? How many degrees of unsaturation? Now I can tell by just looking at it. Now we'll do that next. Okay, so how many carbons are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the saturated component would be C6H2N plus 2, 12, 13, 14. Okay, um, the compound of interest has C6, what's this molecular formula? 1, C, H5. Okay, I mean H6. So each one of these has one hydrogen. So it's H6. Okay, and then we're going to subtract 14 minus 6 divided by 2. So what's 14 minus 6? Um, 8. What's 8 divided by 2? 4 degrees of unsaturation. And let's look at it. Well, you have a ring. What did I say? Ring is one. Um, now you have how many double bonds? You have one, two, three. So ring plus three double bonds equals four. Okay. Um, also, you might see a triple bond. Let's do that one real quick. So what about this one? How many degrees of unsaturation? Okay. Well, how many carbons do you have? One, two, three, four, five. C5. So what's the formula? Five times two is ten plus two. It's twelve. Ten, eleven, twelve. So this is your saturated compound. It was and then what do you, what's your molecular formula of this compound? One, two, three, four, five. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so you got 8. So then we do 12 minus 8 divided by 2. What is that? 4 divided by 2 is 2. So you have 2 degrees of unsaturation. How many pi bonds you got? 1, 2. So you got 2 pi bonds. And you got 2 degrees of unsaturation. Okay, so that's an alkyne. Now, there's also what to do if you have halogens. So if you look at page 336, when um, you have heteroatoms, um, what do you do? Do you count them? Um, you're looking at basically halogens, oxygens, and nitrogens. Um, if you have an oxygen, you just ignore it. So it doesn't change anything to your count. If you um, if you have a halogen, then you have to um, you have to count a halogen. So you count your halogen as a hydrogen. And if you have a nitrogen, um, you count it as a half of a carbon <laughs> because of what it does. So um, they're showing you an example here in your book. If you have something like this, then um, C4HN nitrogen, you would say it's four and a half carbons. Okay, so then it would be C4.5 and H2N plus two would be. 2 times 4.5 plus 2. So that would be 9 plus 2 is 11. Um, 11 hydrogens. Okay. Um, so 
the C4HN nitrogen has one element of unsaturation because it has two hydrogen short of the saturated formula. So the saturated formula would be, you'd have to put in your BC5H, one, two, three, four. C4H is 8, 9, 10. So, um, yeah, that's confusing, isn't it? Um, I am going to show you a different way to do it, but not now. Okay, so let's do an example. That's the best way we'll do this one. Okay, so we got C4H6NOCl, okay, and um, so let's look at a compound like this. So how many degrees of unsaturation? Well, if you had to figure out your saturated formula, C4, what would that be? H 2n plus 2, so C4H10. And then this is your actual compound. So here you have C4, you have H6, and this is if you didn't have this compound here, right? Um, nitrogen, this counts as a half of a carbon, and you ignore the oxygen. The chlorine um, you count as a hydrogen, so now this makes it H7. Okay, so that is your um, formula. So then the saturated formula for this would be um, C4.5H11, because what's 4.5 times 2 is... Um, 9 plus 2, so there's 11. So now you do um, 11 minus 7 divided by 2, which is 4 divided by 2, which is 2 degrees of unsaturation. Okay, so that would be how you would do that. Okay, so we've talked about nomenclature. We've touched a little bit on degrees of unsaturation. I don't spend a lot of time doing that now. I just want to introduce it to you so you're not struggling through your um, sapling. You can review your rules of naming. What I do need to talk to you about is polarity, boiling points, melting points, and then ranking the thermodynamic stability. So if you have a compound such as this versus this compound, which one has a higher boiling point? Okay, so which one has a higher boiling point? Well, you can see that this compound has a dipole. And so we'll just say greater than D, 0 D. Okay, D is di, di, uh, Dubai. So this has a dipole. So it has a slight dipole, dipole and intermolecular force. Here, because of the electronegativity difference pulling in opposites, the dipole is 0 D. Now what happens is that means the boiling point for this compound here is 48 degrees Celsius, whereas the boiling point of the first compound is 60 degrees Celsius. So you're looking at 12 degrees difference in this um, compound that has dipole interaction, even though it's small, would have a higher boiling point. So that you need to think about that and look at the dipole when you're dealing with cis and trans 
diastereomers. The alkenes basically um, have London forces or van der Waals. Okay. Um, the stability. Um, the way reactions, I'm going to give you a new reaction, is called catalytic hydrogenation. And you'll know this reaction will be probably, I would say you're going to have about 20 reactions in Chapter 8. Yep, that's a lot. This will be one of them, catalytic hydrogenation. And so you use a metal, usually palladium, and you use hydrogen gas. And so if you take an alkene, such as this, and you react it with palladium and hydrogen gas, um, the hydrogen will add its gas, will add to the carbon-carbon double bond. So what happens is this already has a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. This alkene is a place of um, reactivity that we care about. And so now this hydrogen here, the gas, is adding to each one of these carbons to make a saturated alkane. And that's how we can convert an alkene into an alkane. So this is butane, and this is one butene. And so catalytic hydrogenation is an exothermic reaction. And um, so it gives a delta H of less than zero degrees, less than zero degrees, um, less than zero kilojoules per mole. Okay, so it's negative. We can measure these heats of um, hydra uh, halogenation and these enthalpies, and then we can figure out a um, stability pattern. So if you look at um, page 348, and you also have um, this table in your blackboard, you'll see molar heats of hydrogen hydrogenation. Okay, so that's the hydrogenation reaction, and these are all exothermic, so they're all negative even though they're reported as positive. And what happens is you can form a graph, and this graph is excellent. And I recommend you looking at the graph. The graph is on page 350 in your book. And it shows you um, an increase in energy. So we know that if something's here, this is more stable at the bottom. And then you go up here, and this is less stable. So all these different alkenes, and we... Um, were converted to their alkane. So when you convert the alkene to an alkane, then the, you can measure that heat, and that's how you can generate this graph. So up here, you have ethene, and then here you have R, Ethene, and these are hydrogens here. And then this is, we'll call this mono. And then you come here and you get cis. These are di. And then you can get geminal, which means it's on the same hydrogen. And then you can get trans. There's trans. Um, and then you can get tetra. Well, I guess try first. The hydrogen there. This is tri, and then lower here you can get 
tetra. So we have di, these are all di. This is mono. This is not substituted. And then you come down here and you get tri and then you get tetra substituted. So what you do is you look at that carbon, carbon double bond, and if it has carbons, these R groups are any kind of carbons. Okay, so what is this one? Well, carbon, 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 three carbons. That's tri-substituted alkene. So its stability is going to be more stable than if you compare it with Di substituted. So the most stable is going to be a tetra substituted alkane. So you'll have to um, rank the stabilities for these alkenes. Also, when you're dealing with um, cyclic compounds and their stability. So um, we don't even say cis on rings because that's all you can get. Okay, so this is cyclobutene, and it can only be cis. So if you draw in your hydrogens, you would see the hydrogens are on the same side. This is cyclopentene. Um, cyclohexene. You can go all the way up to um, up to eight carbons. So once you get to eight carbons, then you can get a trans. So and then you can get um, you're not going to get a trans cycloheptane. Okay, that's not going to heptene. Um, is not going to be stable at room temperature, but you can get, see if I can even draw the eight. Can you draw the eight? It's actually kind of challenging. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A Pac Man. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So you see how that's trans because hydrogen's here and hydrogen's there. And sometimes you draw your hydrogens in there, it's up and down. So you can demonstrate that that's trans. So that's trans cyclooctene. And that is stable at room temperature. If you have to do a decane, it's easier if you almost do like that and then you do that and so that would be trans here draw your hydrogen in there you can double count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten this would be trans cyclo deck -ene. okay so those are the stabilities for the cyclic alkenes um, there's a thing called Brett's rule. We have seen that a trans cycloalkene is not stable unless there are at least eight carbons in the ring. And Brett's rule is talking about a bridged, bridged bicyclic compound cannot have a double bond at a bridgehead position unless you have eight carbons. So eight carbons is your magical um, kind of thing to go by. So let's talk about what a bridgehead carbon looks like. Okay, these right here, this is your bridgeheads. Those are your bridgehead carbons. And also, um, how do you name these? Okay, so these are a bicyclo, and then you put 
your um, you have to have brackets and you have to have so bicyclo and then how many carbons are there one two three four five six seven so this is bicycloheptane okay so there's seven carbons and then you would do them based on which side has the most carbons so you would do this one's four two and this one's two and this one is one so it would be two dot two dash one and you don't count those British heads when you do that in the numbering um, I don't usually ask you to name bridgehead carbon uh, compounds, bicyclo compounds, um, but I kind of want to give you a little heads up because I know Saplin's going to ask you, and I think that that's good. You need those assessments. Just because I don't ask you every question doesn't mean it's imp not important. But um, you can't have a trans bond there at a bridgehead carbon. And the reason why is because these bridgeheads are constrained because they really can't get into that sp3 109.5 degrees of bond angle. Okay, um, at this point I want to talk about how to synthesize alkenes. And then we'll go into Pogel. Okay, so how to do this? We are going to do elimination reactions. So you're going to have E1 and E2. And, and E1 means that the rate of reaction is proportional to your alkyl halide. And E2 would be the rate of reaction is proportional proportional to your alkyl halide or you could say electrophile and in this case and your base because now your bases are going to look like your nucleophiles okay so a base you all know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base and you also now know that nucleophiles have lone pairs and really strong ones also have a negative charge. So you would see, a lot of times you'd see something like this. And you would say, okay, there's my plus and minus. This is a primary alkyl halide. So you'd be like, okay, I'm going to do an SN2 because this is going to happen really fast. And this is going to come here. And then that is going to be my leading group and I'm going to do a substitution reaction. I have three carbons, one, two, three, and then my OH is going to replace the chloride. Okay, and you're going to say this is an SN2. My rate of reaction is proportional to my alkyl halide and my nucleophile. And you can label that as your nucleophile. Now, in elimination, what would happen is you take a, a base, this is sodium hydroxide, okay, so it's called a base because now it's going after a hydrogen, okay, you remember acid-base chemistry? It's going after a hydrogen, and the hydrogen has to be a beta hydrogen, so it's going to go after a beta hydrogen. So what you're going to do is you're going to be like, okay, there's my alpha carbon that's connected to my leading group, and then you're going to find a beta carbon over here, and if this is a primary alkyl halide, okay, then it only has one carbon with beta hydrogens. Now what's going to happen is this base will take that hydrogen. And then those electrons will push the chlorine to be a leaving group. And then you redraw. And then that is an alkene. And that's how you make alkenes. A lot of times you'd want to do this and you'd see a triangle. And that means you're adding temperature and you're making it um, very hot. Okay. This would be an E2 reaction because it would, it has a strong base. 
and it has a primary alkyl halide. Um, E1 reactions go through a carbocation. And so if you have a tertiary, okay, and the tertiary, you got a leaving group. So this is a tertiary alkyl halide and it leaves. So now you have lost your leaving group and you have a carbocation, tertiary carbocation. You check for rearrangements. And then what could happen is like, let's say you have a base. Okay. So if you have something like, this is a weak base. This is your alpha carbon. So you gotta look for a beta hydrogen. And this is gonna take that hydrogen. Those electrons are gonna go there. And then you're gonna make an alkene. What's the name of that alkene? One, two, three. Two methyl propene. Okay. And usually you have heat. Okay, so if you want to drive this to the alkene, then you're going to um, add heat to this reaction. Um, this is an E1 because the rate of reaction is only proportional to the leaving group leaving and forming your carbocation. Um, do you get competition between E1 and S and 1? Uh, usually, yes. You get a carbocation and Sometimes this can go into a substitution product. Um, heat usually helps. If you, if you do this at higher temperatures, you're going to pr probably get more of the alkene. Um, your reaction energy diagram, and we'll be looking at stuff like this, but for an E1, you have energy going here. This is your reaction coordinate. And E1, you're going to start with the starting material. You're going to have that first step to make the carbocation high. And it's going to go down like this. So in this reaction, this would be your starting material. You have to go over this activation energy in order to form your carbocation. Here's your carbocation. And then to form your product here, it would be like that. So there's your energy diagram. Um, for and um, we're going to talk about how E1 always fo follows Yatsev's rule. So it always follows Yatsev's rule. When we and we'll talk about what Yatsev's rule is in your um, Pogel. I will just tell you here, kind of a, a brief summary. Yatsev's rule is um, it's going to form the most stable alkene. Okay, so what happens when you have this molecule here? Um, okay, so okay, so you have this molecule here. What is it? It's a secondary alkyl halide. Leading group leaves. And you have this. Okay. Um, it is a secondary carbocation. You do the test. If it switched place with the primary here, that wouldn't be less. If it went over here, it's a secondary. Okay, so it's not going to switch places. So it's going to stay. No rearrangement. And this is your alpha carbon. Okay, that was your alpha carbon. Now, you're pretty much, if you have this in, let's say, ethanol, and you have heat. So we're going to get the um, E1 product. Well, you need to draw in your, that's your alpha. you got secondary, you got two beta carbons to choose from. Okay, 
So I like to draw in all my beta hydrogens. And you'll learn that if this base, this is acting as a weak base, it's a weak base because there's no negative charge. If it takes that hydrogen, what's that look like? That product looks like this. Okay, if the base takes these beta hydrogens, what does that look like? And so now you look at this and you can add your hydrogens in here. Okay, and then can you see that this is mono substituted? Can you see that this is dye substituted? Which one's thermodynamically more stable? The dye substituted. Yatsev's rule says E1 will always form the more stable alkene. So which pathway does it go? Yes, it's going to take the hydrogen, the beta hydrogen, from the... Um, one carbon that has less hydrogens. So Yas has rule on page 360 says elimination reactions, the most substituted alkene usually predominates. Okay, so you're going to have to form the Yas has rule. Okay, so then we're going to look at E2. E2 reactions. So the E2 rate of reaction is going to be K times your alkyl halide times your base. And this time you're going to have um, a strong base. So it's going to have a negative charge. You'll see stuff like this. This is called an alkoxide. And you're also going to learn that this is stereospecific. So that means that it has to do backside attack. So this base has to take, so this is your alpha carbon, this is your leaving group. It has to take the beta hydrogen that can literally line up and do a backside attack because it has to push the bromine out. And then what you end up getting is. an alkene. Well, and this will determine whether you get trans or cis. So from the looks of this, you're going to get um, a cis compound. So you're going to have to determine whether you get cis or trans. And um, whether it picks this one or does it choose this beta hydrogen. So most of the time it's going to go Zatzaz, but there are those stereochemical rules in the times that they don't. Um, we'll also talk about Hoffman orientation. So some of these, I'd like to go ahead and work our Pogel exercises. So let's work Pogel. 9A, oh, I'm sorry, 10A. Let's work Pogel. Let's work our Pogel exercises um, 10A and Pogel 10B, and then I will do a summary and I'll also fill in anything, any reactions that were not addressed in your Pogel activities.